Good morning, my brothers in Christ and my sisters in Christ who have joined us from the Mount Calvary Baptist Church. Uh, we have today uh, Dr. Esther Ellis, who is our uh, Sunday School Superintendent and one of the very fine members of our Christian education ministry. Uh, we also have another dear friend of mine who is very supportive, Sister Catherine Hogan, and uh, she has been an exclusive virtual member for some time due to COVID-19. But she communicates with me by phone as well as emails, and she is the perfect virtual member. Before we get into Dr. King's speech, which is famously known as I Have a Dream, I want to draw your attention to Luke uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 52, just that 52nd verse. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in the favor with God and men. And this is the reason why our Lord and Savior came to the earth that he might become like us so that we might become like him. And we will never have the element of perfection in these fragile frames of dust. But that's exactly what Dr. King was trying to do in his life. Uh, he was trying to deal with one of the most perplexing problems in our society as a child of God, as a Christian. And one thing he believed that we must see today as well is that we cannot allow the enemy to dictate the rules of engagement. Let me say that again. We cannot allow the enemy to dictate the rules of engagement, how we deal with our fellow man. Jesus came to spiritually recalibrate our souls to the original image in which we were created as having a mind to think like God, a heart to love like God, and a soul to act like God. The other thing I want to bring to your attention is that I was sharing with Reverend Stanley that the late Dr. Andrew Fowler, uh, who was the president of the Washington Baptist Seminary, he shared with me that many years ago in the company of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Fowler said he had shared with this group of ministers that we do well when we organize after various racial crises. But he said in that conversation, we would do better if we were already organized before the crisis began so that we could respond immediately to the various disturbances in our nation. Dr. Andrew Fowler, who is now deceased, said that Martin Luther King Jr. went back to the South, the Deep South, and organized the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Now, Dr. Fowler actually stated that Martin Luther King stole his idea. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, since neither Dr. King nor Dr. Fowler is here to defend themselves, we'll just leave that right there. 
But it is interesting that when you look at the commitment card, listen to me. When you look at the commitment card of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, it has these steps of commitment. It begins by saying, I hereby pledge myself, my person and body to the nonviolent movement. Therefore, I will keep the following commandments of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Number one, meditate daily on the teachings of the life of Jesus. Number two, remember always that the nonviolent movement seeks justice and reconciliation, not victory. Number three, walk and talk in the manner of love, for God is love. Number four, pray daily to be used by God in order that all men might be free. Number five, sacrifice personal wishes in order that all men might be free. Number six, observe with both friend uh, and foe the ordinary rules of courtesy. Number seven, seek to perform regular service for others and for the world. Number eight, refrain from the violence of fist, tongue, or heart. Number nine, Strive to be in good spiritual and bodily health. And finally, follow the directions of the movement and of the captain in a demonstration. And then naturally it's, it, it closed by saying, I signed the pledge having seriously considered what I do and with the determination and will to persevere. And, uh, Basically, uh, I brought this into mind because of this scripture text that I have just read from, that we ought to increase in wisdom, increase in stature, and in favor with God and man. This is the example that Jesus set for us. And remember, he came to become like us so that we could become like him. He became the son of man that we might become the sons of God. So again, we cannot allow the enemy to dictate the rules of engagement with our fellow citizens and individuals, whether it is government, civil rights, the various relationships we engage in in our communities. We must have a mind to think like God, a heart to love like God, and a soul to act like God. I dedicate um, today's presentation to my late brother, Minister John Derrick Johnson. Uh, this uh, presentation of presenting Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech uh, began as a challenge. Uh, today, a lot of our young people spend too much time in technology, and instead of engaging in basketball, they are in virtual basketball with various video games. But what John and I would do, we would look at Dr. King's speech and he actually gave the speech first. 
in various schools and city government programs and even was on radio and television. And I would uh, try to learn as much as the speech as I could and he would learn as much as he could and we kept adding to uh, this presentation until we could give the entire speech. Uh, he passed October the 28th of uh, 2021. And one day I said, John, I want you to watch because we had never done the beginning of the speech. We had always gone to the closing paragraphs. But one day I said to him, I am happy to join with you today in that which will go down in history, in history. as the greatest <sighs> demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whom symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon of light and of hope to millions of Negro slaves being seared in the flames of a withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacle of segregation and the chain discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty amid a vast ocean of material prosperity. So we have come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we have come to the nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, they were signing a promissory note that all Americans were to fall heir. This note was to guarantee all men, yes, black men as well as white men, the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note in so far as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check that has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. We refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. So we have come here today to cast this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. And we also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. And this is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off nor taking the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now's the time to lift our nation from the dark and desolate valleys of segregation to the sunlit paths of racial justice. Now's the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. This sweltering summer of the Negro's legitimate discontent 
will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. The whirlwinds of revolt shall continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of freedom emerges. There will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. But there is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice and our process of finding our rightful place. We must not be found guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and of hatred. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. And this marvelous new militancy, which has so engulfed the Negro community, must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evident by their presence here today, have come to realize that their freedom is bound to our freedom. They have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we will always march ahead. Go back to Mississippi, go back to Louisiana, go back to Alabama, go back to South Carolina, go back to the slums and the ghettos of the northern cities knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. For I say unto you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. I have a dream that is deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day that even on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, that they will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day, that even in the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will one day be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that one day that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today I have a dream that one day that down in Alabama, with his vicious races, with his governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, that one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day that every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places shall be made straight. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. And this is our hope. And this is the faith that I go back to the south with, with this faith. We will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discourse of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we shall be free one day. 
This will be the day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with a new meaning. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring. From the bodacious hilltops of New Hampshire, let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone, the mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring. And when this happens, when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and from every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will all join hands and sing in the Negro spiritual bowl, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. Thank you for your attention and your attendance today. And we declare that in light of what has been happening, not only in the pandemic, in light of what has been happening in our government, especially one year after January the 6th, we must commit and rededicate our lives to Christ that we will be able not only to have a civilized nation, a nation of laws and a nation of justice, peace, and equality, but a nation where justice will roll down like waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. God bless you. Happy Martin Luther King Day and may heaven smile upon you. Uh, Dr. King, excuse me, Dr. Johnson, uh, <clears throat> We thank you so much for just being here today with us. Greatly appreciate it. I think the thing that I can appreciate most of all about it is that, um, you know, a lot of times you have a lot of actors. And it's different when you have people who are authentic. Amen. And we praise God for your relationship with the Lord and your authenticity. So we praise God for you and for just how you embody uh, that message in and of itself. Uh, we go back a long ways and I've actually seen you in action. <laughs> We're going to sing a song now, We Shall Overcome. And it should be on the screen. If you don't have it in front of you, just, I have my professional help on, y'all see? <laughs> Amen. All right. And uh, for those of you who can stand, if you will stand and sing and join with me. Amen. Yeah, see, can I uh, this down here? 